On March the 17th, 1996, Julie and Peter Hastings and their two children, Bradley and Michael, moved into their farmhouse in North Wales. They had been looking for a new home for around six months and were surprised to find a large farmhouse at such a low price. But when they found the farmhouse up for sale for as little as £63,250, they jumped at the offer. Julie had instantly fallen in love with the old farmhouse. The previous owners, the Mellers, had only lived at the farmhouse for four months before moving out. Previous to that, the farmhouse was owned by a widower by the name of Mr. Robert Williams, who had passed away whilst in hospital at the age of 76. On the afternoon of March the 26th, Peter and Julie had arrived at the farmhouse. A few hours later, Peter was finishing off putting the last of the furniture upstairs when Julie shouted up to him to come down for a cup of tea. As they sat in the kitchen sipping their large cups of tea, a sudden crash came from upstairs. Peter ran up to the bedroom with Julie close behind. He swung the door open and was shocked to see that the bedroom cupboard was flat on the floor. It had somehow fallen over. Peter looked around but couldn't find any reason why the cupboard had fallen over. It was a mystery. The first of many they were to experience in the days to come. The following day, Julie purchased some paint from a local store and set to stripping old paper off the walls in the lounge. Peter was laying a carpet in the children's room when he heard Julie shouting to him from the bottom of the stairs. Peter came down to find Julie in a bit of a tiswas. She turned to Peter and said, The strangest thing has just happened. I was stripping that paper off when I heard someone in the kitchen. Thinking it was you, I shouted out to you, but then I realized that you were upstairs. I was sure I could hear you in the kitchen, opening and closing cupboards. Peter looked around the kitchen, but nothing seemed out of place. Peter dismissed the incident, thinking Julie was over-exaggerating, and went back to carpet laying upstairs. It was now March the 30th, and Julie had arrived at the farmhouse around 6.30pm with Bradley and Michael. She had been and picked the two boys up from her sister's house, and was excited at the thought of showing them their new home. As she pulled up the drive, she immediately noticed that the front door was wide open. She glanced around, expecting to see Peter's van but it wasn't there. A cold shiver went down her back at the thought of an awaiting burglar. She walked in further and could not find anything out of place. Julie went back to the car and took the boys inside to show them their new rooms. An hour or so later, Peter had arrived home and Julie confronted him about the front door being open, but Peter was adamant that he had not only closed the front door, but also double-locked it. The couple were so convinced that someone must have been inside their home that Peter telephoned the estate agent that had previously dealt with and asked if anyone else may have a set of spare keys to the property. The answer was no. On April the 3rd, Julie was woken around 3.20 a.m. She could clearly hear Bradley crying out. She nudged Peter and told him as she made her way to the boy's bedroom. Bradley was sat up in bed screaming out that a monster was in the room. Julie leaned over and switched on a bed lamp. Bradley had certainly worked himself up. Julie felt Bradley's head and he seemed a little hot. Fearing he was coming down with something, she decided to go downstairs and get him some cowpole medicine. As she turned the corner and entered the kitchen, she suddenly froze. There in front of her was a huge, dark figure. For just a few seconds, Julie was so scared she couldn't move. Total and utter panic came over her as she screamed out and ran for the staircase. Falling clumsily up the stairs in sheer terror that she may have been pursued, she let out another scream. By this time, Peter was shocked from sleep up and at the top of the stairs. Julie grabbed Peter, jumping up and down, screaming to him, Someone's in the kitchen! Peter pushed Julie behind him and headed gingerly down the staircase. He stopped outside the unlit kitchen and could hear nothing. He slowly put his hand into the darkness and switched the kitchen light on. Peter jumped through the doorway expecting a confrontation, but to his surprise, no one was there. On inspection, all the doors and windows were shut and locked. It was at this very point Peter had considered the existence of the paranormal for the first time in his life. Julie was still hysterically crying. Peter eventually calmed her down and asked her to describe what she had seen. I went into the kitchen, 
and it was just there, stood right in front of me. It was huge. It must have been at least seven to eight feet tall, all black and with some kind of hood over its head, like what monks wear. It was horrible. I didn't see it move. It just stood there looking at me, but I couldn't see a face. Peter calmed Julie and they sat in bed talking about what had happened for a good hour or so. Both agreed not to talk of it in front of the kids. It was bad enough that Bradley had started having bad dreams. On April the 8th, Julie's sister Amanda was visiting and helping Julie decorate the boy's bedroom. They had painted the whole room and put new curtains up. It had taken them pretty much most of the day, and when they had finally finished they shut the door and went downstairs for some tea. Peter soon came in with the boys from visiting his parents. Julie and Amanda took the boys upstairs to show them their newly decorated room. They swung the bedroom door open and stood there in shock. The whole bedroom had been trashed. There were also two strange marks on the ceiling that on closer inspection looked to be handprints of some sort, long bony handprints. Amanda looked across to Julie and said, you can't live here, something evil is in this house, you'll have to move. Julie, now completely forgetting not to mention anything in front of the boys, burst out crying and told Peter that she couldn't live there and that it wasn't safe. The rest of the night consisted of tidying up the boys' bedroom in the hope that the bedroom assault would not occur a second time. The boys were put to bed and their bedroom door was held open by a toy box permanently. The following day, Amanda left for home, telling her sister that she needed to get a priest in. Julie agreed and told Peter to make some inquiries. Peter took a couple of photographs of the mysterious handprints before painting over them in the hope of showing a priest what they had found. It was now April the 14th. Peter had no luck in convincing a priest to call round to the house. He had made two phone calls to local churches, both of which would not assist. As the days passed, frequent and horrific sounds would come from the walls and ceilings. Sounds of pigs snorting and often accompanied by growls. Terrible odours would suddenly fill the rooms. The smell of rotten meat was regularly smelt in the living room and bedrooms. Strange sounds would be heard coming from seemingly empty rooms, such as footsteps, whispers and humming. By this time, Julie had moved out with the two boys and had gone to stay at her sister's, leaving Peter to sort out the house. It was around 8.30 p.m. on a wet and windy April night when researcher Steve Mira received a telephone call from Peter. He could clearly hear that he was desperate for help. They discussed what had been going on for over an hour. It was April the 23rd. Steve pulled up the drive. He could see Peter stood by the side of his car. As he shook Peter's hand, he could see he was a little worse for wear. Two days before his visit, a vicar from St. Alson's Church had decided to call and see Peter after he'd received several telephone messages asking him for help. He talked with Peter for a while and then conducted a blessing in each of the rooms. But as the vicar was reading from his Bible, he became rather lightheaded and had to place his hand on the top banister to support himself. Peter was concerned and asked if he was all right. Yes, replied the vicar. Peter rushed downstairs and grabbed a glass of water from the kitchen. By this time, he had filled the glass and walked to the kitchen doorway. The vicar was already in the downstairs hallway. Peter passed the glass of water to the vicar, who quickly drank it down, thanked Peter, and departed with pace, only muttering the words, I hope I've been of some assistance. Peter stood at his front door with a puzzled face as he watched the vicar sped away quickly in his car. Something had spooked him. Peter was convinced of it. That night, Peter found himself on the verge of leaving his home for good. It was not until around 3 a.m. when all hell broke loose. Peter was woken up from sleep by what can only be described as an earthquake. He shot up in bed and looked around. Everything was shaking. The bed, the wardrobe, cupboards, and even the pictures on the wall. Then came the sudden sound of things smashing and banging about downstairs. Peter jumped from his bed and headed to the hallway. As he passed the boy's bedroom, he suddenly came to an abrupt halt. Looking in, he could see bedclothes being thrown around the room, toys and games falling from the shelves. Then the boy's cupboard suddenly lunged forward, tipped and crashed to the ground. Peter rushed in screaming, Stop it! Get out of my house! 
he grabbed the cupboard and lifted it up. As he turned, he was just about to shout it again when he caught sight of something. He stood there transfixed at an image in the window. Peter had never felt so scared. Physically shaking, he described the image to Steve. I turned, and there it was. I lost my breath for a minute. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The bedroom window reflected an image. It was very clear. The only way I can describe it, and this is going to sound stupid, but to me it looked like the devil. I could only see the head and shoulders. It was a definitive red in color, long drawn face, glowing orange eyes, and what looked to be ram type horns protruding from its head. It just looked right at me. That was it. I was out of there. Enough's enough. I grabbed my clothes, car keys, and I got out of there. I don't believe in things like this, but when you see something like that, then it's hard to dismiss. No way was I staying in that damn house. Steve also checked outside the property and looked around the backyard. At first it just looked like any normal garden, but then something caught his eye. An unusual rock up in the top corner of the garden, partly covered by a large shrub. He moved the shrub aside to reveal a large stone with a pentagram symbol on top of it. It seemed to be etched in the stone and overlaid with possible charcoal. Steve found three such stones in the back garden which Peter and Julie had missed. A strong possibility that someone may have been messing around in things that they shouldn't have. Could this have been a catalyst for such diabolical hauntings? Steve said, I have to admit I was certainly a little anxious myself. Maybe something horrific was really going on there. On showing Peter the markings in the stones, he was rather upset as well as annoyed, annoyed that he had not spotted them. We all sat in the kitchen having a large cup of coffee as Steve discussed his return to the location with other specialists. He arranged to return on May the 4th, to which Peter seemed happy about. On the 2nd of May 1998, the scientific establishment of parapsychology received a telephone call from Julie. She told Steve that they were selling the farm and had decided not to go back. Peter wasn't going to go back to the house. He had arranged to sell the farm as a fully furnished home. As the months passed, Steve often wondered how Peter and Julie had got on. Did they manage to sell their home? Were things still going on there? And most of all, was it really the devil that forced them out?